All right, I'm Jason Green, and welcome to Waste Some Time with Jason Green. It's fitting how the names work. And today, we got a special guest, the lead singer of the band L.A. Guns, Kirk Frolic, after this. All right, let's welcome Kurt. Hold on a second. There you are, Kurt, from sunny Florida. Yes. All right. So, Kurt, let's talk about uh, let's talk about where you grew up a little bit, which would be sunny Edmonton, uh, Canada, right? Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Yeah. 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 Um, I grew, up, grew up there from uh, lived there till '99. Yeah, and talk about a couple of the bands that you were in before you left. Um, I went to, I graduated high school. I went to music college for a year and studied music. And then, uh, I got offered to be in a, in a band in Canada. You could travel, you could play a week at a time at hotels and stuff. So, you know, you could do like a circuit. So I did that. I dropped out of college, did that for a couple of years. And then, uh, a guy that was managed by Paul Stanley offered us, uh, offered me a guitar gig to audition. So I went out and auditioned got the gig and we started sending Paul demos and that was right when they were putting out uh Carnival of Souls and that didn't really fly and so we were the stuff we were sending was sounded like 1984 Van Halen so he said I can't do anything with this stuff we said okay what about doing a kiss tribute and I did a kiss tribute from about 93 till about 97 kind of thing and while uh rock and roll was kind of you know it wasn't like the Seattle scene was really big. And if you didn't do that, do that vibe, you didn't, you know, you weren't getting a shot at creating original music. So, uh, and it, long story short, ended up going to Vegas with my original band and tried to get a deal down there in 99. Yeah. And the, the band, um, loving dead that you were playing with in, um, Canada that you, you were gaining some success with that. Uh, right. I mean, there's, there's an album. Yeah. What, that's what kind of sucked when we were in Canada. We were based out of Vancouver and Alberta and and we finished doing a record and then we got a show with Motley Crue. We opened for Motley Crue at the like the hockey rink in Vancouver, which was like that was a big deal for yeah. an indie band, you know, like us. And then we had we were we went back to Alberta to finish our record that we were doing, which is, you know, drive-wise to Vancouver is like 12, 13 hours. And then Motley Crue contacted us again and asked us to do another show because uh, the, it was the Scorpions. Motley Crue was their greatest hits tour and they had a opening band and the Scorpions said, if you don't get rid of this opening band, we're not touring anymore. So they Motley Crue contacted us and we, we didn't have any money to get yeah. from Edmonton to Seattle or I think it was Tacoma, or Tacoma was our show. So that was like 15 hours and getting over a border. And we were like, heartbroken that we couldn't do it so we started gaining momentum and then we left canada we left all that momentum and started from scratch over in uh in uh las vegas yeah and so when you got to vegas then you changed to the name the underground rebels right yeah the reasoning for that was we uh the loving dead was kind of uh it from me as you know i'm a horror fanatic and uh uh 70s glam rock fanatic so it was kind of a mixture of the two. It wasn't really Rob Zombie and it wasn't really, you know, like that horror, but it was like 70s glam rock meets kind of Rob Zombie type vibe. I guess that kind, you know, that type of feel. Yeah. So it was a different fit. And it was uh, a different vibe. Though, now, yeah. Yeah. Now the name Loving Dead, like everybody, if you Google it, you'll find like 10,000 uh, Loving Dead. But uh, yeah. Yeah, it was kind of people were putting this in. You you guys must be like a death metal band. We're like, no, we're not. We're like 70s glam rock, really. Yeah. So when I met you, I came out to Las Vegas in 2000. And everybody would say, you've got to go see, you know, Kurt and D from this band, uh, Underground Rebels. And you guys played a lot. And there wasn't much uh, original bands that were doing that. Yeah, we had a weekly at the dive bar. We played every Monday and we played like half covers and half originals. And that was like, and we did it every week. And that was, was great. You know, you're playing your original music live every week that, you know, that really fine tunes it, I think, you know, 
instead of doing yeah. one original show every six weeks, six, eight weeks or something, you know? Absolutely. And what, what was great for you is you were making your living. You were playing in a show here in Vegas, playing guitar in a Neil Diamond show, you yeah. know, a tribute show. So you didn't need the original music to pay your bills. And the reason I did the Neil Diamond thing is he did my visa. Cause I was Canadian, I'm Canadian, I was Canadian. Right. And I was like, Either I go home, what am I going to do? And it was, it, it's funny, it came at like a pretty strange time where I was like, I'm out of money. I don't have a visa. I can't work. What am I going to do? And then my buddy from Tacoma actually called me and goes, Hey, I met this Neil Diamond guy. He's on tour and he needs a bass player and a guitar player. So D and I were like, Okay. So he, we met him in a parking lot. He gave us cassettes of the material and he was doing wow. a nightly show at the Riviera. It was an hour a night, seven to eight o'clock. And we're like, perfect. You're going to do our visa. Plus we're going to get a really good weekly wage and we get to stay in the country done. So then yeah. that, that went on for like eight years. So. Yeah. You would do that show and then you'd be able to go play a rock show at night. Yeah. And it was you know, pretty I wild. There's a lot of Neil Diamond fans out there. Musicians wise, like Vinnie Paul would come in and, and, uh, uh, my buddy Ray, who plays with Corn, he brought in like the Stone Temple Pilots guys because they're a Neil Diamond fan. A lot of you know, get a lot of a lot of I came to rock see fans. it. I came to see it with Cheetah Chrome from the Dead Boys. It doesn't there you get go. More than that, yeah. So <laughs> um, it's that's it's, you get everybody coming out to see Neil Diamond. But yeah, so you, you know, Kurt, I always say that you were definitely one of the busiest working musicians now as well because you would not, you would do you do tribute shows you would do corporate gigs uh, and then of course the original music being your uh, you know your priority so while the underground rebels was building you added Brent Muscat from Faster Pussycat to the band on guitar who i had known also and uh, and so that was going on for a little while and at that point i was putting on a, a party uh, during the AVN convention here in mm -hmm. Vegas and they need, uh, and so for my company, we wanted to have a band. And Brent and I were always batting ideas around what to do. And at that time, he was a little disappointed in the um, direction that Tame Me Down was taking Faster Pussycat. And uh, and now this was before I was an expert on copyright law, like I am now. But so <laughs> Brent researched that the trademark for Faster Pussycat had never been renewed, which a lot of bands kind of let it go. Yeah. So. What he did is called a race to the trademark. He said, I'll do it. Um, and he contacted Eric Stacy, you know, who was the original bass player for Fast Pussycat, and then uh, Brett Bradshaw, who played drums on the second record. So he had three of the kind of core guys. And uh, he thought that this would hold up. And so he said, let me put together a band. And he got, uh, he got you to sing and Todd Kearns to play uh, the other guitar. Yeah, they didn't know each other then. He goes, I need a guitar player. Who do you think? And I go, I got the guy. He just moved here. Helped him get a visa through the company I was working with. And uh, he was down. He, he wasn't down for very long. He was, and uh, I said, you want to go play in Faster Pussycat and do a tour? And he's like, yeah, that sounds cool. <laughs> he, he was smart. He was also an opportunist. Maybe it's a Canadian yeah. thing. But he said he yes knew. to everything at the time, yeah. yeah. And he would hang out and knew I'll get up and I'll jam a song and people will see, you know, that I'm a, I'm a talented guy. Yeah. And uh, and so he was great and he sang a lot of those backups and those Faster Pussycat oh, songs. Oh yeah, he can sing anything. Yeah. Yeah, and because again, that might not have necessarily been your voice singing Faster Pussycat might not have been something um, that was second nature to you, but you you took on the 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 task. Yeah, I'm, you know, like with LA Guns, I'm such a fan of Faster Pussycat that it's like Brent is asking me to do it. And I was saying, you know, same thing. I was a little hesitant at first, but I'm like, I don't want to say no. One of my favorite bands that I grew up with, you know, and love, I love the songs. I love the vibe. I love the whole style of it. So, I, you know, I didn't want to turn it down. Yeah. And it was a good product because at the time, Tammy was doing a lot of a different direction. Yeah. And the idea of this was to play the core songs that fans wanted to hear and some ones um, that were a little bit deeper cuts. And so, uh, and so you guys did that for a while and you actually um, took it to Europe. Right. And it was received well, I think. Right. Yeah. The, the set was solid. We just, we did like the first two records, pretty much almost all of those first two records. Well, maybe not all, but, and then we did a couple off whipped and 
people loved it because they they sounded like the records you know obviously i'm not the original lead singer but the music everything was like it sounded like the record the tempos you know everything the vibe everything yeah and, that's and what people so, wanted at the time because they hadn't heard it in a while yeah and at that time they were starting to be more than one band of lineups you know this was starting to happen <laughs> yeah. you know uh, i think actually started, then there was two la guns too at that time too there was definitely two la guns and and i think great white might have been one of the, the big ones yeah. to set a legal precedent at least because they ended up doing um great white and then allowing jack russell to call his band jack russell's great white mm -hmm. so tame me down got a wind of all this and served brent with some legal papers now Brent could have went to court and, and and fought, and there probably would have been some kind of great white thing. You know, maybe he would have had to call his this, and they would have had to call theirs that. But he didn't want the fight. Uh, and maybe the difference in great white was that Mark Kendall and Jack Russell had formed the band together. And in Brent's case, I think Tammy kind of had it going. And what, what's a funny coincidence, and there's a lot of coincidences with Faster Puss Again, LA Guns, is that the, the rumor is that Mick Cripps is the one who suggested the name Faster Pussycat to Tammy. Um, so that's one funny thing. And then the other funny thing is that Kelly Nichols was the original bass player for Faster Pussycat. Yes, Cat. Kelly has so a great story all, about that first signing the deal and everything. Yeah. yeah, And breaking his leg in a motorcycle accident. Yes. Uh, essentially cost him the gig. But, um, but so yeah, there's a lot of parallels in your life as we're- It's crazy. Yeah, I know. There's never just a straight story, you know. It's always a and something. I'm always like, it's careful what you wish for when you're like 22 years old and you're like, oh, I want to play in that band. <laughs> you know, Isn't that the funniest thing? Yeah, <laughs> never true, to. man. <laughs> um, so so anyway, so at that point, Brent folded and and didn't want to continue. And then yeah. I, and I, yeah, and then you know, and, and so um, so he was playing in your band, Underground Rebels, still for a little while. Yeah. And, and what's funny about this is, so we had a gig. So I had another gig. And this was in 2007 for the AVN convention again at the Canyon Club uh, in the Four Queens Hotel. And they yeah. wanted me to put together a band. And so we were going to kind of do the Faster Pussycat lineup and and not call it Faster Pussycat and maybe see where it goes. And so that was the plan. But uh, somehow things with you and Brent didn't work out. Imagine that. And... <laughs> He, he was no longer in the Underground Rebels. And so there was a conflict about doing that show. So we didn't know what to do. So you you just said, I'll sit that one out. And we had Todd end up singing. And we didn't really actually know that Todd, how much he would sing. He did a few, and then we had special guests. And funny enough, Jizzy Pearl, who was in LA Guns, uh, sang that night. And then the, the last guest was Phil Lewis of LA Guns that night. No kidding. So, yeah, it's just this weird world. So that show ended up becoming the first Sin City Center show. Um, it was kind of fun and, well, let's just keep doing it. And so at that point, um, they were going to make an album and they brought you in to pretty much produce and uh, an engineer and, and really put that record together with them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the uh, uh, Even uh, Todd and I really worked on or hard on that record. He was over, you know, every day, and I even sang some backups with him and played a little guitar. And but you yeah, might say was... a little, you might say a little guitar. I say a lot of guitar, but <laughs> <laughs> that's neither here nor there. But um, yeah. But anyway, that record's very was very popular at the time, and things were growing. And it wasn't long after that record was done that Todd got the gig with Slash. Yeah. Um, we always knew that someone was going to come knocking. It was not a surprise. That's when Todd was living in Canada. I said, you got to get down here. Get out of Canada, man. Like, you come down here. Somebody's going to offer, you're going to do an audition and you're going to get a gig with a, with an act. Yeah. And, you know, we, we, and I'm sure he knew that too, you know. And, I think and so, yeah. Didn't take long. We He's sold stupid. that band as, come see the guy from Faster Pussycat. But we knew that when you got there, you were going to see like this great rock star that you didn't know about. Yeah. And that's sort of what happened. So when he went on tour with, with Slash, we needed somebody to help us out. And so we here here comes Kurt Frolic again. So <laughs> came and did a, a bunch of those shows with us. Yeah. Um, which was a lot, which was a lot of fun and, and definitely saved us. And we, you know, we and and you know, you the thing that maybe people don't know about you is that you know a million songs because of what you do. You and you're a guitar player. 
as well. You know, I, I, and, and so you could jump into a show and go, okay, I can do this. Yeah. Being a guitar player and a singer when I, cause I wasn't a singer until the loving dead started. I, we, I remember looking for a lead singer and I'm like, I, I'll just sing. <laughs> and then it just took off from there. And then I started taking vocal lessons and, and it was like, and then my, my work world opened up because if you can be a singer and a guitar player, you, you know, you can get, yeah you can get work. And, and here in Vegas, they were in need of somebody who could step up and do that. You know, there's mm -hmm. a lot of, uh, you know, shows, costume shows and things that need someone to step in. And you started working, I don't know, you were probably working six, six nights a week sometimes. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I was doing here. Even here when I moved to Orlando, it took a while, but before the pandemic, I was working six days a week, sometimes seven. Yeah, well, and that's an interesting thing that we'll we'll get to with LA Guns as well because it, mm -hmm. that's a definitely uh, causes a bit of a situation. So, oddly enough, I uh, Sinners was still going, and we still ha had the idea to bring in guests. And yeah. so, oddly enough, um, and I knew Tracy Guns, and I knew Phil Lewis, and so oddly enough, I ran into Tracy Guns at the uh, Hard Rock Hotel at Mr. Lucky's, no longer there. Yeah, and bummer. I said, to him, I said yeah. <laughs> A total bummer. And I said, why don't you come and guest with the sinners? And he wasn't really into it. He was in town doing that rock fault show. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, if you change your mind, think about it. Next day he texts me and he said, I'll do it only if uh, Phil Lewis does it. So, and I was, I wanted that angle, but it was hard to bring up. So Scotty Griffin was still playing with Phil. And I said, run it by Phil. Cause I didn't want to be the one to get yelled at. You know, I, I thought right. it <laughs> gonna happen. But so anyway, we got them to do this show and it was a Christmas show of Toys for Tots benefit. That, I mean, we would have done the benefit anyway, but that was the, kind of the piece between the two of them. And, right. and we were paying Tracy to be a guest and Phil said, I'm only going to do it if you don't pay Tracy. We both do it for free. And so we told him yes. And we paid Tracy anyway. Um, <laughs> but so those guys came on stage and it was funny, actually. They go backstage and they're both meeting their new young girlfriends or wives. You know, they haven't seen each other in 12 years or so. And wow, so we, really? yeah, yeah. So we did that show and they, they did well for them. And they decided, you know, they're going to get the band back together. So, um, which was cool, you know. Um, yeah. And I feel, I, you know, I feel like, Kurt, I feel like this is your life. You know, I'm telling you all the, the backstory of your own future gig. We're getting to your gig, though. Um, yeah, yeah. And so, because unlike all the other interviews who have to ask you, how did you get in LA Guns? I have an inside uh, track to it. Yeah. Um, but it's, but it's so. Starts, it started with you. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately. Well, I'm to blame. So, um, so when those guys were doing their thing, Phil Lewis has this tendency, I'll put it mildly, of just opening his mouth at times. Maybe he shouldn't. And, um, you know, I was saying, I see all these people interviewing you and it, it, and one, because you have something to talk about, but I think a lot of people think that they're going to get the, the, the blabber mouth metal sludge headline out of you. And that's just not who you are. You know, you're, that's, you're a business person. Yeah. And the other guys in LA guns as well, that this is not this rivalry. So, well, to them at least. So Phil has this tendency of shooting his mouth off. He said some stupid stuff uh, to me and I said, well, you know, I know how I'll fix Phil. I'll just call Steve Riley and I'll help him put together his LA Guns. Because th this was going on for a while. The M3 oh, really? Festival. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the M3 Festival was disappointed. With, and this is all factual. Yeah, I know the backstory, yeah. Yeah, yeah. M3 Festival was disappointed with those guys and wanted a band. And so they were looking for people. And they were looking for ideas. They were looking for people who used to be in LA Guns. It was sort of, I don't think anyone knew the exact direction. But as you know, Steve Riley owned half the name in him and uh, uh, Tra Tracy both trademarked the name and the logo. And so when they left and Tracy and Riley have some differences, as you know. And mm -hmm. so when they left that behind, um, Riley still had a name. And so now you add Kelly Nichols to the project who no one had seen in years. Um, they wanted, they needed a singer. And so I play in a band with Scotty since he rejects a little punk band. And he was telling me the names they were looking at. And I said, like, these guys are all wrong. You know, I didn't, I didn't like their choices. And I also thought it wasn't the move to just put in um, 
this is the guy who sang with, you know, the Bullet Boys for an hour. Or I said, I, I got a guy who, who fits, you know, um, he, he's got the look, he's got black hair, he's got the sound, plays guitar. And most of, uh, importantly, is easy to deal with, you know, because yeah. if you're putting these things together, it's fly dates now, you just don't want to travel with, with, with a jerk. And so, they, so anyway, I, I was going back and forth with Riley and they watched some videos of you, but they, they watched the wrong videos. Like they were watching like some of your cover gigs, you know, like the tribute things that you do. I think they're watching like spasmatics. Yeah. And so they didn't, they didn't get it. And I go, you're watching the wrong videos. And so then I sent links of oh, Underground yeah. Rebel. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and then you got me some, I said, you got to get me something, Kurt. So we sent them some of the faster pussycat stuff as well. Um, right. And then they were, and they were, they were hooked. And so Riley told me, don't say anything, uh, but give me his number and I'm going to do the rest. Now I've talked enough. Now t tell me what it's like when Steve Riley contacts you. He called me and, uh, uh, he obviously did his homework on me about one, what kind of person I was, what kind of business, how do I do business, how I, how, if I'm professional or not. And, and he obviously watched a lot of videos because he was like, I love how you sang this and that and this. And I, I told him, I go, Hey, I'm not Phil. I, I don't sing at all like Phil. I'm not, you know, that's not really how I do it. So I have a different voice. So I'm not going to be able to, comp some of this stuff like you know the record or whatever i can do it my way like i can do it but so i was hesitant and he he really was like no nah, man you can do it we don't want you to do that we want you to be you we, we saw you know we've seen what you do we just want you to do that and i was like okay and then i thought about it for a while and uh went from there i lost you you still there yeah, yeah i'm here oh, okay yeah and i and uh so I listened to a bunch of the material before I made a concrete decision. And I was like, okay, yeah, I could sing a lot of this stuff and this, and because I, I know the material and I, I love the stuff, but when you're thinking of, I never thought about singing it before. So when I went through and listened to a lot of, it, I was like, man, I love this stuff. I realized how much I loved it. And I was like, yeah, man, I want to do it. I don't want to turn it down. Yeah. And, and I warned Steve, I said, you know, Kurt is a working musician. You had the week that they wanted you to, to start the play. M3 would have been your first show. You had a corporate gig that probably paid a lot more money. Um, yeah, I, I do a lot of corporate work for companies and, you know, everyone from Sony to whoever, you know, fly yeah. out dates. We flew, we just had a, we were supposed to go to Germany a couple of months ago. Obviously that didn't happen, but so I do, you know, but. Uh, yeah, so I warned know, him that, you're, you, if you do it, it's not going to be because of the money. It's going to be because of the passion. Yeah. Do it. And and I liked your attitude, which is I'll probably kick myself if I don't do it or don't try it. Yeah. And anyone who plays in original bands, LA Guns is an original band. You know, we it's when you put a record out, you're not the the checks aren't rolling in. That doesn't doesn't happen. So. So and it's also, not it's not going to be your main source of income if you're a full time musician, which I am. But uh, you know, it's but it's, new uh, exposure to you well, that is is the other great thing. So Ellie yeah. Guns is going to do what it does, but now there's people who might go look at your other records, come see you, and showcase you. And so, who you know, what might have seemed like it's just going to be, uh, you know, you're going to do the M3 festival. Hey, great! I think a lot of people thought that might be the end of it. That was supposed to be it. That was yeah. all that was talked about at the first phone, couple phone calls. And then um, you decide to make a record. And there it is. Yeah. And this record is made fast. We um, got the deal. We got the record deal from Golden Robot from that M3 show, from the one and only show that we did up to that time. That's how we got the deal. And we were, we were like, I remember Steve's, I don't know if he called me or sent an email. He was like, we got a record deal. And we were all like, no, we didn't. What? what? <laughs> so yeah, yeah. It was crunch time to make a record. So we, you know, the budgets aren't what they used to be. And so it was, you know, flying guys in to Los Angeles to try and do it is, uh, it's not cheap. So. Right. And Kelly Nichols lives in, uh, on the East coast in New York. Yeah. And, and then you live in Florida. Scotty's here in Vegas and Steve mm -hmm. is in LA. Yeah. Um, and so 
Talk a little bit about how you come up with songs for this record. I know some of these are ideas that Riley had a long time ago and mm -hmm. Kelly. And then I know some of this is your music as well. Some songs that, you know, some of it I was familiar with. And yeah. So, um, so talk a little bit about how that happens. We all brought songs to the table. Say we put, you know, it was approximately, I don't know, over, over 20 songs, over 30 songs probably. And we all listened to everything and we all kind of said, I like this, I like that. I think we could do something with this. So at the end of the day, we all got songs on the record. There's all, everyone has songs on the record and we split everything four ways because we yeah. all had input and we all, you know, we all worked hard on it and uh, we learned the songs and we would, I did pre-production on the stuff I was doing and I'd send it off and go, and Kelly would call me and go, I don't like that pre-course or whatever. Why don't you try doing this? And I'd cut it again in my studio and send it off. He'd be like, okay, that's cool. You know? So we had the foundation mostly of the stuff we were doing. So when we did get together, we rehearsed this stuff. And if we had to make any changes or we wanted to do whatever we did before we went into the studio. So it, the power of the internet, you know, helped us make this record without that, it, you know, it'd be next to impossible really. Yeah, you might not have been able to do this. So talk about how long it took and, and, and sort of what it was like. The first three days we went in uh, to uh, mates rehearsing and we uh, we just pounded away at the stuff. And, you know, people played it with their flair, which was cool. If people brought stuff that was either previously recorded or brand new, you know, everyone put their taste on it. And... Uh, after that, we went in the studio and Steve cut his drums like he kicked ass. He did, I think he did him in a couple days and uh, got all the bass done in the first couple days and then had to sing everything. I had to sing everything in like six days, I think. It was a challenge, you know, but uh, everyone, everyone has their stamp on this album. So that's why it has diversity and that we are all in the studio recording it together instead of recording it from our home studios and sending and right. sending in parts. I think that's what gives it depth. And, uh, you know, it has a good, I think this album has a good range without stepping too far out from what LA guns should sound like. Yeah. And, uh, you know, this was this, uh, and I think people were excited of the possibilities of this, you know, um, Kelly Nichols had been out of the music business for quite some time. He was raising his stepdaughter, which is Emma Roberts, the actress, yeah, and uh, had his own life. And so, and and Steve Riley didn't have to do this, but if you have the name and you want to still play music, um, and he has the right to do that, you know. And I know for you, you stayed out of any drama because it's not your argument, you know. It's not your. You're nope. just doing your job and we're very open about saying, I'm not going to sing like, you know, Phil Lewis. I'm not a, this isn't going to be, you know, the Phil Lewis um, tribute show. Um, so Phil Lewis is quite upset, obviously, uh, um, about this. And the, the issue that I have with it to an extent is that all of a sudden he's worried about this integrity of the LA gun sound. But Kurt, I, I, to my knowledge, you're the 12th singer <laughs> to have sang in LA Guns. Wow. Um, I didn't know that. Yeah. A lot. So I, <laughs> I had to break my toes out to count that. So, and this is all the different versions. And so there was times when Phil wasn't in the band and they made records. They made a record with Jizzy Pearl. They made a record with Chris Van Dahl. Really horrible record. Um, <laughs> called with American Ralph? Hardcore. <laughs> yeah. Right, Ralph. Yeah. Uh, yeah. From Steel Panther. He was a singer uh -huh. for, for LA Guns. And so um, and at that time, things were lean. And I think that's why Tracy and Steve put that together and trademarked the name together because it, they were going out tough. They were opening for small things. And and um, and so anyway, their business differences have nothing to do with this band or your your problem of it. You sing the songs in a, in a different way. But I think fans like that. And maybe they'll also like this new music. And so there's room for, for different bands. You know, Going forward, as you know, the hard rock scene is good. This is how it's going to be. You're not going to see full lineups, especially in bands that can't play. You know, Motley Crue can do it. They can afford to travel separate and never see each other. And yeah, you know, those things. Aerosmith can do it. That's what they do. 
Yeah. Well, the way they just got, even got rid of the Joey Kramer or whatever. You know what I mean? So it's like, it's always <laughs> exactly. some craziness. Um, but so, you, like I was telling those guys, you were the right guy to step into this. You didn't let the drama bother you. If those guys want to talk negative, um, as you've said, well, it's only going to be another plug for the record, you know? Yeah, I'm just... I'm just happy to play music for a living, you know? Yeah. Really what And the record is getting primarily good reviews. You know, yeah. um, most of the reviews I see, and I think there's a lot of people who say they were surprised, um, you know, or, and there's people who didn't want to say they liked it, maybe because they liked the other band. But, you, don't, you know, I, I heard you say, Kurt, that, you know, you don't have to choose. Yeah, I don't think you have to. You know, so, I, mean, I, I put myself in Kelly or Steve's shoes. Imagine yep. being in a band for that long and then saying you can't like you, you can't do it anymore. That'd be a that would be a bummer, you know, your your life's legacy and you're out of it, but you still, you know, from Steve's standpoint, he still owns you know, a piece of it legally. So, I I understand. I understand the both standpoints from each guys, you know, from both yeah. sides, so, but well, if you yeah. take the time to trademark something and the money, and you put the effort into it, um, you, you're, you're going to you should fight for it. And so, yeah. Steve also in in his case, and again, I'm not other than kind of coincidentally being involved. I have nothing to do with LA Guns, um, but uh, although I, I mean, me and Paul Black are going to put together our own LA Guns. There and, you go. Uh, <laughs> it was his. That was his joke, not mine. But. Um, but so the uh, uh, Steve Riley, from what all I heard, he kept LA Guns together for I don't know ten years or so. He yeah, did at all least, at least I think he was booking shows. He was, you know, he was the tour manager and so and book, you know booking the van. And so when Phil left, I think for him it may have been a little bit, uh, you know, hey, you left me high and dry, and I kept this product going. Um, and so yeah, he I, it's, he he wasn't ready to retire, and so. One of the other things I want to point out, Kurt, as you know, is that the, the band members' names in your lineup are on everything. I've never yes. seen a poster or a picture that doesn't say who you're seeing. We don't want to confuse anybody. Thanks for noticing all of this stuff. You go to our website, right on the top of the website, it says our names. On the album, the back of the album, it says our names. We don't want anybody to be confused with the lineups. You know, yeah. we're not trying to fool anybody. Uh yeah, and, and that is very clear. And in these day, this day and age, there's no excuse not to do a little homework before you go to the show. You, you know what I mean? It's it's not Absolutely. quite like it's not quite the platters, the coasters, and the drifters, and the, you know the yeah. temptations. And but yes. there's different lineups. Our agent, our booking agent, sends out our stuff. Here's the guys. These are the guys in the band. This is our logo. This is our photo. This is you know we don't and, and, you know we don't want any fans to be confused. You re-recorded um, some vocals for some of the hits, didn't you? Um, no, we have no, we haven't recorded anything like that. Okay, I thought you might have done that because I know at some point. I, I don't mean for um, for public release. I mean for agencies. Usually, they'll have you sing some tracks that they, uh, you know, for commercials. Not no. I think they just not. use uh, if if they're going to do that. They there's so much stuff on the internet now. It's like yeah. anybody can pull up anything. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so, like you said, you're being as um, transparent as possible with it. So, you guys were had a bunch of shows, obviously, coming into because this record's made in 2019, I believe. Yeah, right? right. Thanksgiving was our last day of cutting the record, 2019. Crazy, yeah. And so, you go into 20, and you do play a few shows, right? Or did you do any in 20? We, are, we did. We just did uh, Las Vegas with. Uh, D Snyder. Right. That, that was in the summer of 2019. Yeah. So we didn't okay. get any shows af after cutting the record. We didn't right. get any shows done. And I think that, but uh, there was stuff booked. It just obviously yes. couldn't, couldn't happen. Yeah. Um, and it was down to the that. wire too. We were supposed to go up to New York and do a, a run up in like Pennsylvania, New York, New York, New Jersey. And it was literally down to days before, like, are we going? It was at like at the start of March and you know, thank, thank God we didn't go because yes. it, that's New York was the first place that, you know, everything went down first where like everyone's, everything started to like spread like wildfire. 
Yeah, and, and for sure. And and in a lot of ways, you're fortunate to be in Florida where there are different restrictions and things and you're able to play, you know, social distance, but you you play your acoustic shows and you have other things that you, you know, you're doing right now, right? Yeah, I got rock bands down here and we uh, play out. The good thing about Florida is the weather, except for today. It's supposed to go down to freezing tonight, first time in a few years. But we play outside and we can do safe gigs, you know, and play. some places are offering to our bands to play inside and we just we're not we're not there yet we're not doing that yet yeah and i think that's and i think that's smart you know we we had gotten offered shows here in vegas and sometimes you have to think about the audience and think well, is this a good decision you yeah know? absolutely but, yeah because maybe the sick, band, man we, there's light at the end of the tunnel why like risk it now <laughs> yeah yeah and so uh and luckily you guys have a product so that when things can get back on track you know, there's a record. I know you guys put out, uh, and you guys are doing it old, old school, you know, like a side A, side B, you know, yeah. it says on the back of the record, which I love. And then also, you know, you're putting out songs in, in a single form. I know there's not as much radio as there used to be, but, but there is still some. And so yesterday you guys put out um, a song. Uh, tell me a little bit about that. Uh, a song that uh, Steve brought to the table, uh, You Can't Walk Away, and we kind of revamped it from because it was a it was an older song and we really it was released i think on uh 27th of january so it was released a little while ago but uh it's uh i think it's a great strong kind of stonesy type vibe kind of a ballad i guess it's not really it's it's got a little more edge than a ballad i guess but um yeah and if you listen to the record it's just that song is so much different from a song like crawl or something, you know, or well oiled right. machine. So that's kind of the diversity that I think people that are being open-minded and listening to our album, they're appreciating. Yeah, I think so. And there's stuff like lost boys and crawl, as you said, that well, a machine that may reach the, you know, the, the classic LA guns fan. Um, but in this day and age, of course, the name LA guns, um, because Steve has it and there are two members, original members, you want, you know, original, but you want to bring in people to hear the music. And so there's enough room for people to hear different music. And at the end of the day, does it sound like every LA Guns record? No, but did you want it? You can only write about the same thing so many times. And I think the people who are open-minded um, will enjoy this. And, and the record, you guys put it out on all kinds of different uh, colored vinyl. I mean, there's all kinds of cool options. Golden Robot is awesome, man. They they've worked really hard on on uh making us a brand and everything and and promoting this record and putting out cool different colors of vinyl and special offers and packages and so i want to give a big shout out to golden robot they've really you know been behind yeah. us without them like none of this we, we wouldn't be able to put out so people can see like hey man listen this is us we're not just it's not a money grab and we're not just going out and playing song playing the you know the classic material we you know we want to write our own material we got something to say what's the la guns uh, website kurt so that people can, can it's check it la guns.net net. LA guns you, okay. yeah you can get the album there uh, lots of cool merch and stuff so cool and kurt is there somewhere people can find um your other bands like the the uh, underground rebels records and stuff um Underground Rebels, since I've been doing L.A. Guns, I really haven't stepped into that. I've been, you know, I'm always sitting here writing and recording. And uh, so I'm, I'm always like, I might, like I wrote a song a few days ago. I'm like, ooh, that'd be a cool L.A. Guns song. So it's always, you know, I'm always creating. But uh, as far as seeing what I'm doing, it's probably Facebook. You can be, uh, see whatever I'm doing around right now, yeah. just around Florida, but. And I think yeah. some of your other music, the older music is on Spotify in those places, right? Yeah, the Underground Rebels and the Loving Dead stuff is on iTunes and probably on uh, Spotify and some other streaming stuff. So, Yeah, so in addition to hearing the New LA Guns record, there's that too. Yeah. Anyway, Kurt, my band, I appreciate... The, oh, Go sorry. Ahead. And my band, The Hooligans, uh, I play with the guys from guy from Seven Mary Three and a couple of guys from Blue Man Group. And we... Uh, did an album while we were in quarantine here. So that's out there right. too. Yeah. It's uh, the, the hooligans And uh, it's kind of like British rock meets just 
good time rock and roll, a la Cheap Trick, a la, you know, stuff we love. So, well, and you took advantage of this um, downtime. Yes. You know, so we put out thing. a full 11 song record, seven originals on it. And then primarily that band's a British rock cover band. We do like, you know, all the British rock we love. So there's four British covers on there and then there's seven originals on it. So, all right, Kurt, before you leave, the top three are universal horror movies. Oh, I change top mine all the three. time. So, I know I love, I get, I go on, as you know, you probably go on kicks, mm -hmm. but Bride of Frankenstein. Probably yeah, Johnny Ramone. One. Johnny Ramone says that as well. And that's yeah. way up there for me. I think it's amazing. Bride of Frankenstein. Dracula. Mm -hmm. The original Dracula. Uh, Frankenstein. That's three. Creature from the Black Lagoon. That's me too, yeah. I Creature from the Black Lagoon. Not four. <laughs> yeah, but we can count Bride and, and, and Frankenstein is the same. You know what I mean? Like yeah, yeah. yeah. But for me, Creature from Black Lagoon was the first one that I saw, you know, as a kid. Me because, too. Yeah, because it came out later. And I remember Burger King had these 3D glasses and you could watch it in New York on Channel 11. And so I was a little kid for Halloween in 3D and, and uh, the 3D was terrible, you know, the red and blue. And so that a creature always holds a close, uh, close place. And then Dracula and Frankenstein kind of go back for me. The, I, I've been on the Frankenstein kick lately. I like the the Dracula ones though that came after, like Dracula's daughter and all that. Those are cool. Yeah, the, and, and it's great that now we have access to all of them. They've been restored. And yeah. Everything, so and you can like just stream them anywhere. Like yeah. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Yeah, no, so cool. But yeah, I think we're in, I think we're in agreement. I mean, maybe there's somebody out there who's gonna say, you know, the Meta Luna mutant is my favorite character. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And, you know, I like the Invisible Man, but stuff like that. But I'm like, I just love the monster stuff. I love the, you know, the yeah, whole the cool. vibe, everything. I like, I'm a horror fanatic. I watch, I watch a lot of horror movies. So everything from thrillers to, you know, exploitation movies, so like all sorts of stuff. So I, sometimes I watch a movie and I literally, a couple of days ago, I was watching a movie on Shudder, which is a horror, exclusive horror streaming. And I watched like over half of it and I go, and it wasn't that old. It was like, and I'm like, wait a minute, I've seen this. I've done that a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm like, that's how many I've seen. That yeah, I'm like, lose, I'm, lose I'm it's not like the first five minutes I realize. I'm like halfway through, I'm like, oh yeah, I've seen this. <laughs> do, you, do you ever watch, I'm, I'm sure the answer is yes, but do you ever watch a movie and just go, are they for real? Like, how did this movie get made? What, what, is it meant to be this bad or, 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 or was it an accident? Yeah, well, that's, you know, how it is with technology and everything, whether it's, you know, anybody can make a movie now and put it up and next thing you know, it's on Hulu or whatever, you know. You like make it on your phone. Yeah, and a lot of movies, people just shoot with their phone. But yeah, some of the stuff is campy enough that I love it. Like that, have you seen that, the Danzig movie he just put out? No. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay you got to check that out. It's on Shutter. Yeah. But it's, uh, I can't remember what it's called. It's called er Eroctica or something, but it's like. Oh, yeah. yeah I think I've seen it. It's, it's so gotta be, it's gotta campy be that it's like, you know, I sat through the whole thing. <laughs> well, I used to work for. Probably didn't, but I did. I used to work for, you know, Trauma, the, the movie, Toxic Avenger movie company out of New York. Yep. And so we would review a lot of movies. And, um, and there were times I would just go, I can't tell, especially the 70s ones. Were they really like? Was this? Were they so ambitious? Like, you know, Ed Wood. What, I don't think Ed Wood set out to be funny. I think he really thought that. Oh no! Yeah, he was serious. Yeah. And yeah. you know, some of those trauma movies are like they. They always have the camp in mind. I think when they're making them, but they're like, we're just going to make it. It's like it's, punk rock, you know. <laughs> it's, it's funny because they, I they hired me to write a co-write one called Tromeo and Juliet. And they sold it to me under the idea that this is the first serious trauma movie. It's going to be these rival mm -hmm. families. And one's like a deli owner. It was very New York. And, and they, and one's a nightclub owner. And, and uh, I didn't get it. And so I had a chance to go to the Cannes film festival and they brought in this other guy to, to really finish the movie. And he ended up really writing, which was James Gunn, who now is like the biggest Hollywood director, directed Guardians of the Galaxy, Suicide Squad. I'm never good at picking talent, I, well, except for you, Kurt. I, I was right about you, but every, every, you, now you got to you got to go out and get a Diamond Award and you know or something and prove me right. 
but uh, but so anyway, they 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 realized halfway through that this was not going to be a serious movie. And right. it was like, I remember like we better get the fart noises ready. Like I remember, <laughs> you know, like in editing, it's like they have these se- this like this serious scene. Like we better put the fart noises in. Dude. That's what makes some of these campy movies like. Troll Two is the famous one. Have you ever seen mm-hmm. Troll Two? Oh yeah, I remember it's that one. Yeah. The mo- it's they call it the best worst movie ever, because obviously the guy that made it, he was from a foreign country, in the states, and there's even a documentary about it. But I think it's called Best Worst Movie. And Troll Two, they made it, thinking is seriously, but it's right. so bad because it's trying to be so good. That's what makes it. That's what makes it campy and like worth watching. On, <laughs> yeah. That's what I love about a lot of those movies that I watch. Yeah. They're good. Uh, yeah, they're definitely good late night. Relax yes. your brain and and and, uh, and watch. But uh, anyway, Kurt. Well, thank you for joining me. I'm glad it's been a long time since I've seen you. So hopefully, yeah. Thanks, uh, this Jason. Will, yeah. Hopefully, this will end and you'll be back out uh, again. So it'll happen. It's coming. Yeah. It's coming. Okay, Kurt. You take care of yourself. Thanks, Jason. Thank you.